Hello and welcome to the first of our digital roadshows, Licentiate. Now we'd much rather be coming out to see you around the UK or even overseas, bringing print panels with us, but COVID-19 has put pay to that. However, we're looking forward to this session because digitally we'll be able to see even more work and answer any questions you may have at the end. It also means we're joined by photographers from across the globe, from Australia to America, India to Indonesia. So licentia, the first distinction the RPS offers. And the beginning of the process is to look at our website and view the criteria and guidelines. And as you can see, there are four things we're looking for. Camera work and technical ability, visual awareness, communication, overall impression. And you can find them all on our website. And it really is important to take all this on board before putting in for a submission. Well, now to guide us through all this, I'm delighted to be joined by one of the most experienced photographers we have in the society, Ray Spence, FRPS. Hello, Ray. Hi, Peter. You yeah, okay? Yes, fine, thank you. Nice to see you. Um, now, your licentiate was many, many years ago. Uh, what do you remember about it? Well, very little apart from the fact that the um, panel was actually featured in the journal. So that is a great memory for me. But uh, it was a long time ago. I was very naive. Um, there was not the information coming from the Royal Photographic Society that there is now. I was just fortunate to have uh, a good memory. Solihull Photographic Society, Bob Moore, who guided me through it. So other than what Bob told you, there wasn't much information then about what you had to do? Not really, no. I knew very little about the Royal Photographic Society, to be honest. Um, and uh, even putting the panel in, I'd never seen a panel before. So it was uh, all a mystery to me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if we could just advise everyone not to do it the way Ray did it. No, um, <laughs> no I had good I, advice. I had good <laughs> advice. That's what's so let's, let's go into a little bit more detail uh, then before we do the first successful panel. Licentiate, 10 images required, of course. Um, now, camera work and technical ability. What does that actually mean? Does it just mean a working knowledge of your equipment? and how to use it, of course. Um, yes, I mean, the thing is, obviously, nowadays, um, more and more cameras are very smart, they're very clever, they automate. We're looking for people that understand how to control the many uh, controls on the camera, everything from diff different lenses and the effect that, for example, a wide angle lens would make to a, a telephoto, um, the way that uh, focal length, uh, the way that apertures affect the amount that's in focus, shutter speeds, um, all of those things should be under the control of the photographer rather than letting the camera make all the decisions. And then visual awareness, that's obviously very important, but it can mean a lot of different things, can't it? It can do, and I think that comes with time, visual awareness. Um, in fact, that's one of the things which I really appreciate from having taken up photography because I, I am more visually aware now, I think. So learning how to see at what point in time something is happening, which can be translated into film, to look at light, the way light affects things, um, how things are juxtaposed. Um, all of those things form our visual awareness. Um, and Nowadays, when I, I go out, even without a camera, I'm constantly looking at scenes and I can see these things as though I was a camera. So in other words, <clears throat> you are seeing rather than looking. That's right. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there are, it, it, it helps if you know what you're looking for in certain circumstances. I mean, I don't think many nature photographers are just going to wander around and by chance find the right animals or plants that they need the prior knowledge. Um, but certainly being aware of what's going around and being able to react <clears throat> to what is around you is important. And then communication. Yes. Um, and again, this is something I think which comes with time. So very happy to get a, get a sharp, well-exposed picture. Um, 
But then we think, well, why have I taken that photograph? I mean, there must be millions of photographs on people's hard disks, which never get to see the light of day. Um, so what we're trying to do is think, well, why are we taking this picture? And what is it trying to say to us? And if it says something to us, hopefully it'll say something to other people who see that image. And then overall impression. Well, the overall impression, we, certainly we're talking about the, the, the panel rather than just individual images, I think, um, is that we know that a person can consistently um, take good photographs, meaningful photographs, those which communicate under a variety of conditions. So that's what we're looking for with our overall impression of a panel. Now, we should stress you don't need the latest fancy camera costing thousands of pounds. You can, of course, use a smartphone if you like. And we have had successful panels shot and edited on a mobile phone. And it's also important to say that any submissions are assessed purely to the criteria. It is not a question of what we like or don't like. And we don't compare your work to other panels or to our own work. It's simply a case of whether or not it meets a criteria. But Ray, it isn't a question of tick boxing, is it? Or achieving a mark, like a percentage. It's just whether it meets those criteria. That's right. Um, it is hard to be totally objective when one looks at, at images because if they do communicate, hopefully they'll have some sort of effect on you. And if they don't, well, they haven't succeeded. Uh, but it's, as you say, I would not recommend anybody looking at the, the criteria and just saying, right, I've ticked that box off, I've ticked that box off. Um, just generally in your camera, in a variety of situations, different lighting from different viewpoints, um, and just experiment. And then you will probably automatically start reaching those criteria. Okay, let's have a look at our first successful panel. It comes from David Travis, LRPS. Let's have a look at the hanging plan, um, which is, of course, the way the images are presented. And they can be on one row, two rows, three rows. Um, what do you reckon about this panel if we go through the images one at a time, Ray? Well, I think this is a, an extremely strong licentiate panel and fulfills all the criteria that we're looking for. Um, it involves using different lenses different shutter speeds, different times of the day, um, different types of lighting from studio lighting to natural lighting. So let's Look go on to image one then, shall we? Yeah. Okay. Here we, here we have a, a good studio shot um, where the, 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 the lighting has been really well handled. We haven't got the typical looking straight into the camera. We've got that extra interest um, and that lovely uh, highlighting the eyes, um, wonderful studio shot. Image two. Yeah, this is someone who's looking um, from different viewpoints uh, and looking down on this uh, helical structure. Um, it really is a very, very strong image. It's well composed. It's very easy to not make the image um, symmetrical. We've got the added figure which just gives us a point of interest and the colour combination is good as well in that it's limited really to those warm yellows and that cold blue so extremely well. Here again this is a matter of seeing. Now a photographer may have come across this but I'm guarantee almost that they've seen this this um, this wall art and waited for the right time for something to happen and it's um, a great use of the urban environment and also the use of scale here. Again here the photographer has shown the uh, ability to work in different ways not just out in the natural environment but also again back in the studio and using uh, close-up macro techniques. And we've got here a very shiny surface and a rusty surface, very easy to overexpose that. And it's all been handled very well, keeping detail in both sides. A lovely portrait of the, the bird here, po quite probably um, um, a captive bird, but um, 
it's it's well um, composed. The uh, background is nice and neutral. Got this lovely catch light in the eye, and the way the bird's turned its head looking back into the picture is is wonderful. Good detail in the feathers, sharpness where it should be sharp. Yeah, wonderful example of good composition where we've got the lovely lead from bottom left to the top right with the uh, joining by the, the pathway. The light is interesting where it's grazing across the surface of the hills there and light in that foreground. And then we've got this beautiful calm reflection going into the background. So the, the foreground is strong, the background You froze just for a moment there. Ray. I froze today. Yeah. Okay. I'm not quite sure which point I froze, but I was saying uh, wonderful use of lighting here, um, grazing the surface of the uh, the hills there, and this contrast between the foreground and the rather subdued background, which is lovely and calm. And of course, the the link between the bottom left and the top right is a, a good compositional tool. High speed photography, again using a, a telephoto lens and very fast shutter speed. Of course, nowadays with modern cameras, um, it's quite easy to achieve very high shutter speeds to freeze the action. But here, the action is where the, um, the sportsman is coming directly at the camera, uh, which, is, which is probably the best way to get a sharp picture rather than having to pan uh, from side to side. The, angle of the the, the 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 man we've got this lovely angle uh, on the diagonal peak of the action obviously the person who's taking this photographs understands the sport and very often that's key to, to taking good photographs is to understand the subject matter are you still there yes we can hear you okay good um going back to a more of a natural history type shot uh, this little harvest mouse or whatever it is on corn. Um, very sweet, lovely composition. Uh, caught the mouse looking directly at the camera. Uh, and again, uh, like, like the bird shot, a lovely subdued background, not, not imposing. A very quiet, um, probably late afternoon early evening shot by the looks of it with this lovely warm light um, the recession uh, get moving away and the color on those posts that gold and yellow against the blue um, just makes the picture and this shows again uh, the photographer being able to take good photographs under different lighting conditions here We've got a nighttime shot, lovely reflection. So obviously the <coughs> viewpoint has been well chosen. Also the time of day or night has been well chosen in that we've still got detail um, in the buildings. We've got detail in the sky. You can see it's a slightly longer exposure with the movement of the clouds. One of the problems sometimes we get with nighttime shots is there's absolutely no detail in the sky. Here, timing is, is all detail everywhere highlights and shadows extremely well handled i love the way the bridge um points out to that figure which is silhouetted that that, that sculpture which is silhouetted so compositionally very strong as well okay thank you very much ray and thank you to david travis lrps um i suppose we should say that we're asking for variety but that word is or can be misunderstood can't it ray yeah, um, variety, I think I think of variety really in this context as being able to approach uh, subject matter in different ways um, in terms of either lighting, um, perspective, viewpoint, um, even in sometimes using different materials. Um, so one can have uh, 10 images of churches enormous variety in the way that they're photographed. 
So it's approach rather than necessarily subject matter. Oh, definitely, definitely. Okay, yeah. well, let's have a look at the next one because it's quite unusual for a licentiate panel because it has a very definite theme and uh, it's also underwater. <laughs> it's from Nur Tucker LRPS, so here it is. Um, this is really unusual, isn't it? Very unusual panel, especially for licentiate. Um, very strong panel. Obviously, uh, the author here um, really understands underwater photography and the techniques involved. Uh, but even having, um, I suppose, mastered the, the uh, taking photographs underwater, we see a great variety of approaches. Um, well, let's, both should we go the, through them one by one, Ray? And sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, um, th th this is, um, it's almost like a, a still life setup shot. It, it could be, um, and the coloration, the blue the, and the red, um, is very unusual, I think, for an underwater shot. Um, the, the fish itself, um, probably as a nature shot, people might um, have a little issue with, but I think pictorial, it's very interesting. And it's sharp on the eye where it should be, but we've got that, that juxtaposition between the fish and the background. It works very well. This is a beautiful shot, that shaft of light um, coming through onto the, the seal, just lighting it in that cavern or whatever it is. And the light on the, um, the stones works wonderfully well. Fairly monochromatic, but very often, of course, underwater, a lot of the uh, light is filtered out and we end up with blue shots when there's no flash involved. Lovely shot there. Something very different um, using uh, the figure. In this case, the um, figure is sort of like breaching the surface of the water. And I assume it's turned around 90 degrees. Um, very vital, almost a, an underwater fashion shot. Uh, the movement of the, uh, the dress and that stark black and white of the stockings. Um, very interesting shot. Limited colour, which I quite like as well. Here we, we've moved into much more a wide angle shot going into this shoal of fish and they're all moving outwards from the centre. And again, the limited colour palette is, is interesting, the blues and the yellows. And we've even we've got detail right from the surface to the bottom. So we're not losing any detail at all. Um, really lovely, lovely shot there. Another underwater shot, there's more, more of a portrait, a very unusual portrait. Again, very strong colours. Um, that dominant red, which normally, of course, is uh, going to distract the, I think, the, the highlights on the face really pull it back again. This is more of an informative shot, I suppose. Uh, the, the, the barnacle encrusted vehicle underwater and the home as it were it becomes the home for the fish so it has a bit of a, a narrative to it as well i love this shot of the ray um obviously taken in shallow water against the sand uh, there are two rays there one going one way and one going the other way uh, but the way that it's uh the, again the surface of the water is included um really adds to this picture and i like the way that this photographer often looks at the surface of the water. Saw that in the uh, the fashion type shot. Um, really is quite a, 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 a key part of, of the imagery. Again, a totally different approach. Now we're going sort of macro into this um, hermit crab using flash one assumes because it's gone very black on the, the background but that flash has allowed us to see all of the detail on the face of this hermit crab, the eyes, the structure, we can see the little anemone inside the shell, the coloration, so um, this is more of a, a natural history shot uh, whereas some of the others are much more pictorial so again a, a good variety of approach. Yes, uh, the, the, this is less dramatic, but I, it really shows, again, 
the way that the photographer is approaching his subject matter. We've got the, this abandoned ship and then the, the three divers. And the one thing this obviously shows is scale. So by taking that viewpoint and using the juxtaposition coming back a bit, we show the scale, which was totally different to the last image we saw. And this is a wonderful shot. Um, the photographer's got the lens showing both what's above the water and below. Obviously, having to mix lighting from, from, from below using maybe flash, and then the ambient light above of the, of the sunset. Really well handled, uh, both technically as well, um, showing the underwater world, that thin layer of the uh, meniscus of the, the sea, which is still reflecting the image, and then the boat and the um, sky in the background. Beautiful image. So quite difficult to achieve some of these images, but I suppose we should say whether you're on your own or on a workshop abroad or something, doesn't really matter because we simply assess on what we see in front of us. Of course. Okay, um, I think it's fair to say the last two panels, if we come off this one now, were strong, very strong at licentiate level. And it's worth making the point, isn't it, Ray, that you can just about scrape over the bar, as it were, and still be at the level, or be way above it. I mean, there is a, a big distance there. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, we're seeing a much higher standard at licentiate now than we used to. Um, Technology has improved. I think people, what's involved, was also um, improved. Um, so yes, I mean, but there is, a, there is a spectrum, as there is in associateship, not so much with fellowship, um, but uh, there is a spectrum. So we are in hopefully encouraging people when they apply for their licentiateship. If they don't quite get it, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a learning process. And all we're trying to do is hopefully improve their photography. But what, um, would, you, what would you say to somebody, though, who keen photographer, not been doing it very long, and is frightened, frightened in the process, thinking, well, I'll you know, I'm, I'm not sure I can do this. Uh, is it a question simply of seeking advice? Well, obviously getting advice is, is important and getting advice from the right people. Um, you might have your family and friends saying you're a wonderful photographer, but really you need to speak to uh, a panel member if possible. Um, and you'll be surprised that, uh, hopefully uh, pleasantly surprised, that everybody is encouraging. And that's what we will try to do. Criticism's got to be constructive to show people the right way. Of course, you have to have your own personal vision. Photography, for most people, especially at licentiate level, is a hobby. It's a pastime. It's fun. And we don't want to stop that. But we want to help you make your images better if you can. OK, thank you for that. Good advice. Uh, let's move on to another successful panel. And this next one is from Mike Kitchingman, LRPS. And again, it's on a theme, architecture. Um, looks a very clean panel, this Ray, carefully thought through and nicely presented. Very well thought through. And if we look at the panel as a whole, we'll see it's extremely well balanced. We've got form this pyramid, which of course is architectural as well. Um, we've got the top row there with the very strong verticals and then the, the centre one looking up, which again is a vertical. The bottom panel, the bottom row, we've got number seven and ten, these strong diagonals holding them in. And in the centre, we've got a symmetrical um, image, which actually the diagonals, as you see, go down to the images seven and ten. So all of these things are holding the panel together. Um, it's what we sometimes refer to as the eleventh image. Where, but um, all we're looking at is the impression uh, that the photographer has thought about how to put these images together to form some, some sort of cohesion. So the 11th image doesn't mean you have to have 11 images. It means of course not. No. the whole <laughs> thing looks as if it's a, a, a separate image because you're talking about the presentation and how, how cohesive the whole thing is. That's correct, yes. 
Okay, let's have a look at them individually then, shall we? Have a quick whip through. Uh, yeah, good, good, strong vertical. Again, taken from a higher viewpoint to show this image. Uh, and I, I actually quite like the very limited uh, sort of monochromatic feel, although it's just a touch of colour in, in the base. But actually going up uh, to, to photograph the building from another building really has worked. You see the landscape below it. So we get that sense of scale. Looking from a different viewpoint, we've talked about that before. Uh, we've seen looking down onto stairwells and that sort of thing. This is looking up. And of course, this is what we uh, often see with cityscapes. And what I also like here is the way the reflections are working. So some of these surfaces, though they're solid, you can almost see through them. So you have that secondary information and interest. And again, th th this is different from the first image in the, again, we had this very strong vert vertical, but we look at it from street view. And not only have we taken a lovely uh, point in time where the light is on the building against that dramatic sky and the reflections in the water, but there's a very strong coloration as opposed to the first image where we've got this punching uh, lime green uh, umbrella which forms a, a, a central point at the third. A totally different type of architectural shot here. We're looking at the, the detail inside a church. And again, we've got that lovely lighting, which we see in churches, just picking out the colors on those flags and the textures on, on the stone. So again, a totally different approach. Going to monochrome here. You'll notice that's the only, though the first one was monochromatic, this is the only true monochrome, and it's being put in the centre of the panel, very strong position to put it. Again, uh, looking up, upwards, which shows the majesty of this, this cathedral, very strong lines leading up. So monochrome has worked well here because it's about sh shape and form and design. This is interesting, again, a different approach. Here we're looking through the wall, through the doorway at another building or another part of the building. So the, making use of frames um, contra, uh, is, is a well-used technique, but it works really well in this case. And I quite like the limited color palette. Yeah, a very strong image. Um, Slicing from left to right as a diagonal, we've got these um, vertical um, pyramids. Um, we've got the yellow against the blue. We've got, it's one of those images you can look at a number of times and see different things in. And I like that, in that we can see what's hopefully the reflection, could be both reflection and it could be interior at the same time. It's one of those images which you can look at for a long time. Again, a, a totally different approach. The photographer has shown that he understands what um, differential focus means. So in this case, rather than these sharp images of architecture, we've gone in closely on just one little feature, this, this rusting bolt and the cobwebs, and we're using differential focus for wider aperture mm. to make them show against the background. And a lovely nighttime shot um, of these silos or whatever they are, the steel, uh, which has got this reflection of the red on one side, the blue on the other side, uh, very strong circular shots against the other vertical and uh, some like um, more rectangular um, parts of the image. And this, as I say, complements the other diagonal in, in the, the set, but it's totally different. We have almost abstracted it, but we've got this extremely strong colour vertically against the uh, more monochromatic um, diagonal in the foreground and the almost monochromatic background. It forms a very strike to the panel.
you'd think, wouldn't you, with an architectural panel with a theme, it would be difficult to avoid repetition, but actually tremendous amount of variety there. Tremendous amount of variety using different types of uh, building, going in, uh, looking at different times of the day, um, details, reflections, um, and even a more urban shot in number three. Okay, um, so what sort of photographer do you think produces a panel like that? Is it somebody presumably with patience? Should we come off the image now? Um, someone with patience obviously in planning. Well, obviously there's a, a, a fair degree of planning involved. You could, it's like landscape photography. Um, you've got to look for the lighting conditions on, on, on these buildings. The light is the key to photography. And obviously the photographer has gone to these places at the right time using the right light. It's also well, obvious that it's also obvious the photographer knows about the buildings because he's been able to take the right viewpoints. So there's been a lot of planning, I would say, in, in this panel. Well, we can test out that view because we have the photographer with us now, Mike Kitchenman, LRPS. Mike, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, thank you, Peter. Good evening. Good evening. And so are you a patient planner? I Yes, I would say so. I'm, I'm a bit like a dog with a bone and I've got something in mind. I just can't get away from it until I get what I want sort of thing, you know. It's, uh... All right, well, take us through then. What gave you the idea, first of all, for this panel, this theme? It's architecture's always been a love ever since I was young. Um, I was a child just after the war. So I lived in London and lots of bombed buildings and you could actually see the structure of the buildings, um, you know, the way they were formed. And then that fascinated me. And as sort of time went on, I sort of wandered around London, you know, in my early, early days, saw all the architecture and all that. And it's, the architecture's evolved, especially in London, um, and various forms and so on to what it is now, you know, and it's, it's just something that's always fascinated me. So it, it was the obvious thing to go for, for me. So obviously there is planning, but is there also capturing the decisive moment in architectural photography? I think there is actually. Yeah, I mean, it depends. In my image uh, number three on um, Black Forest Bridge, um, I intended originally just to get the picture of the building, number one Blackfriars, which uh, in the rain, it was glistening, you know, it was wet, glistening and so on. But then looking around, you know, there, there were people wandering around and, and as luck would have it, the guy with the the green umbrella walks into the view and as he got there sort of 50 percent between the the lamp post and the building i just sort of uh, snapped it and luckily enough um it worked you know and uh, that's the thing I, so there can be an element of street photography or, or or um you know candid sort of photography in architecture but um not to escape from the main sort of thing of the architecture that's just an addition so the moral is to be ready at all times? Well, more or less, yeah, hopefully. Or, or, or be extremely anal like I am at, at times. So wait from when you first had the idea, how long did this take you to accomplish? I think around a year. When I, when I first thought about doing a, a panel, I, I got a group of 10 pictures together and I thought, yeah, these are quite good. They're, they were my favourite pictures, a lot of my favourite pictures. Then I sort of left it for a week and went back to it having read the uh, the guidelines and then i realized that that they were far from you know perfect or you know and that they didn't even go halfway there and that i learned then that my what are my favorite images aren't the right images for the panel what you need to do is read that the the, the uh, criteria for the panel and those are the things to look for you know and, and to avoid sort of you know halos and uh, various things, you know, overexposures, underexposures, you know, and all these various things that, um, that come out when you read the criteria. I think that should be your, your barometer. If you're Do you going think we have it. to be more precise in architectural photography? Um, in your approach? Yes, to a certain extent, in as much as, um, I suppose, you know, sort of looking at the sky as well as the architecture, getting getting the balance between the two right. And again, it's very easy to get, um, you know, you're exposed, you can get halos around buildings and things like that. So you need to sort of be fairly precise. And, and you, look, went, you went on a workshop, didn't you? 
so I, um, I didn't go to a workshop per se. I went to a one-to-one -one with Stuart. No, I mean, uh, you, didn't you go uh, a trip in London with Inyaki? Oh, and, that, yeah, that, that wasn't so much, but that was a sort of a, a gathering of, of minds. <laughs> ah. Uh, yeah, I mean, Inyaki was coming over to London and um, he, he emailed me sort of saying, shall we meet up? And uh, we met up in the morning and spent the day together. And the, the picture of the Shard, actually, we were in, uh, in the Sky Garden of um, number 20 Fenchurch Street, which is the, uh, the Walker Talkie building. I took that picture from there. Um, but we spent the day together, you know, and we, I mean, I, in, I admire Inyaki immensely, you know, his, his um, F panel. That sort of said to me what the, well, the, 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 in, the, in that case, the 21st image should be about. The whole thing was so cohesive, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, I, I admire him greatly, you know, and uh, we still converse. So, yeah, uh, we should explain Inyaki Hernandez Lassa, FRPS, specialist architectural photographer, uh, achieved his fellowship in fine art uh, last year, I think it was, maybe the year before, uh, and he's a great help to people. Uh, and talking of help, uh, you mentioned one-to-one -one advice. Um, what happened there? What, what good did it do you? Oh, immense good, actually. Um, the, I had my panel set up and I, I had a one-to-one -one arranged with Stuart Wall. And um, he, Stuart's got a, a, a way about him, which is, I just think is excellent. It puts you at ease. And it's sort of, rather than saying this is right and this is wrong, he suggests things that get something in your mind turning over. You know, you sort of think, yeah, that's got to, that's right. But never actually says, no, this is good, this is bad. It's just that, that element of suggestion there. It's guidance, really. And um, he made several suggestions. Um, well, in actual fact, two, two of my images didn't, um, they, they weren't quite sharp enough, which I, I, I was looking at more of the image rather than the, the detail of those two particular images. They weren't sharp enough. And as he sort of mentioned, you know, I agree with it entirely. Mm -hmm. And I moved one image, the, uh, the, um, the, picture, the Met Metropolitan um, Cathedral in, uh, in Liverpool, number five, moved that to the centre of the panel so that um, the flying buttresses pointed down toward the numbers seven and ten which sort of seemed to reflect back upwards and the two upright buildings were like sentinels either side of number two and the the top part of the cathedral reached up and carried on up through the skyline of number two and so the it, result was the the overall look of the panel was more pleasing if you like yeah and i i it was more pleasing and to me this this is how it should look you know this this is the individual pictures are important, but that actual hanging plan is also something that's very important. And I, I saw that in, in Yaki's panel, the way he put his together. So I, I tended to concentrate on that. But Stuart was a great help. And then the few bits of advice he gave me on that panel, on my panel, um, they improved it immeasurably, you know. And uh, as I say, it was just a sort of uh, an interplay between us. And, uh, you know, he made suggestions. and. It's got a, a very, very good way about him, you know, a very, um, very good way of conveying what you should be doing without actually making that sort of deliberate suggestion, do this or do that, you know, it's... Uh, we should explain, I suppose, that this is the one-to-one -one advice is via Zoom, so you share a screen and can look at individual images and talk to each other rather than simply receiving written advice or something like that. Oh yeah, and it, it's far, far superior. I mean, the thought of getting written advice and then uh, there may be sort of an ambiguity in what's written down and what your mind says, but to be able to discuss that with the, um, with the uh, uh, advisor on a one-to-one -one basis, it, it, it's just so, so much better. I mean, that was the, the most instrumental thing in getting me to actually submit my panel and, and feel content and happy with it and uh, give me the sort of... Uh, the impetus to put it through. Excellent. Now, what about becoming an associate? Um, yes, I've been I've been toying with this. I've been jotting down sort of various notes. I probably will concentrate on architecture uh, as it's it's the thing that I enjoy. But I've been sort of looking at various sort of the interplay between statues and architecture or parts of statues and architecture. 
abstracts, minimalism, and I also love brutalism in architecture. So that's another avenue I could explore. But at the moment, that's very much up in the air. And I'm looking forward to the um, the next roadshow uh, coming up for the um, the ARPS advice. I shall certainly be attending that. And um, basically, uh, it's a chicken and egg thing, whether to um, formulate uh, a statement of intent and then do the photographs accordingly or an amalgam of the two or whatever, you know. So I'm, I'm not really quite sure how to go about it at the moment. And, and I'm sure that will become much clearer once I do the, look at the roadshow for the uh, A. Well, let's hope so. And congratulations on becoming a licentiate and best of luck for the future. Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. OK, Ray, I suppose we should say that um, at licentiate level, you don't need a statement of intent, but you do for associate and fellowship. Uh, are you there, Ray? I am, yes. You are, excellent. Can you hear me? Uh, now, of course, nowadays you can apply for a distinction at any level. You can go straight in at L, A or F for fellowship, um, if you think you're good enough. But how important is it, do you think, especially when you're at the beginning of your photography hobby, um, to have the sort of grounding that a licentiate gives you? Oh, extremely important. I mean, it's almost like um, a visual language which you, you, you're starting to learn. Um, once you understand the language, you can then start using it, manipulating it, um, using whichever bits of the language you want. Um, and so I think it's extremely important. I mean, we do see, obviously, as people go for a, up to the other levels, they probably become very much more focused on one area of photography. But that's usually because they have that grounding uh, and know how to use uh, any part of their language, to be honest. So licensorship, I think, is a great grounding. I did my licensorship. I'm very glad I did. Um, and I, I've worked my way through. And each stage teaches you more and more. And of course, the more images you take, the more you will progress in your photography. Hopefully. <laughs> As long as you think about the images you're taking, um, it's not just about quantity. Um, it is thinking about the images and looking at them and being objective, if you can, about your results. Um, I've started using new techniques and I have to really look at them and think, well, this went wrong, that went wrong. Why? How can I improve it? And that's the way to go. So is it important to allow yourself to take risks of course. And there's nothing to stop you. I mean, most of us are not being paid for our photography. Most of us do it because we enjoy it, because we love it. And I love taking risks and I love the serendipity uh, which occurs sometimes when something happens which you didn't quite expect. And that's happened a lot in my photography, I can tell you. OK, now we're having a bit of a day of themes because this next successful panel has a travel theme or possibly documentary um, but it comes from Yilan Song LRPS and this really is quite fascinating isn't it? It's a wonderful panel yes um, very very strong as you say uh, possibly a little bit between documentary and and travel um, which is which is fine at LRPS um, taken in different locations uh, taken in different lighting uh, and techniques, uh, but very, very strong uh, overall impression of the people which are being photographed. It's all photographing people and hopefully showing the interactions between those people. Well, let's have Some a look. Some of the images are very pictorial. Actually. Sorry. Let's go through them one by one then, shall we? Yeah. Yeah, this is a very strong opening image. Uh, obviously, prayer. Um, we've got the very strong juxtaposition between uh, the prayer leader uh, and, and the congregation there um, using in this case probably a very small aperture because most things uh, are still sharp even though the figure in the front is the sharpest we can very easily see the faces of the people in the congregation I particularly like the uh, fit that small figure bottom right who's holding his hands up looking back at the prayer leader. Uh, 
writing is wonderful and that sense of scale and commitment of these people really comes through so it communicates to me lovely vitality in this shot taken from a higher viewpoint um, again uh, we've, we, we've got fantastic lighting here because very often in these situations the lighting is very contrasty but here we seem to have got detail everywhere there's no blown out highlights um, we've got the joyous faces in the middle the two main characters and even the uh, on, on the left hand side we, we're bound to get people on the edges of the frame but we can see that they're all involved, the, the little girl on the lady's shoulders. Um, and it just shows enormous vitality. Very, very powerful shot this. Totally last two we've seen. Um, almost a sort of like menacing little figure in the middle looking directly at the camera, um, staring us out. It's taken from a low viewpoint which really works, whereas the other, other two are at a high viewpoint. And we've got this, the light falling on the, the little boy, the figures obviously forming this natural um, tunnel which directs our eye directly at the boy, but also as a secondary point of interest. There must be some sort of ceremony involved here, uh, which we d I don't know about. Coloration again works extremely well, the yellows and the browns. Um, and the earthy colours work so well. Extremely powerful portrait there. Yeah, this is much more uh, documentary in style in terms that um, it's showing this rather painful little operation. Uh, what I do like are the two little boys on the left-hand side there looking on. I uh, wonder if they remember that happening to them or not. Um, but it shows part of that culture, part of that life. So again, it's informative, it's communicating something. A little group shot here, which is, which is quite interesting. Again, uh, good lighting, um, show, showing the, uh, the tribal markings on, on, on these women um, and the, or the beadwork in the background. So a lot of information there. Um, they're not all staring into the camera as well, which is something I quite like. They're obviously involved in looking at whatever else is going on, maybe the ceremony, maybe other people dancing or whatever. So it's well captured and well seen. Totally different approach here, where we've got this um, very minimal uh, steps well lit and that little reflection so a very pictorial shot only one color really the red which really stands out strong position of the figure not sure what it's about in this case but as I say pictorially it works very well in terms of composition and design so it shows that the photographer is not able only to record uh, activity of people in, in various situations but also be able to construct an image in terms of shape and design and, you, and lighting of course. Again this is more of a travel type shot um, showing the way these women are, are working on their boats and looking down which, which helps. Again informative good use of colour. Similar shots to the other group we saw, but um, in this case, much more isolated against a very dark background. Um, one of the uh, women is looking into the camera, the others are looking away. What their situation is, I don't know. But again, that, that very strong lighting has been extremely well handled. Um, and that good liberty color palette of the vivid oranges uh, against the blues and the, the darkness of the skin. The skin tone is particularly well handled. Love this little shot. Again, totally different. Uh, going in close to look at the expression on this little 
a boy or girl's face, um, those eyes really do take your attention. The big eyes, lovely reflection, good use of um, differential focus, and the lighting has really caught the uh, expression on this li little person's face extremely well. Possibly, maybe the dark hand, background has been darkened slightly, which has really helped um, the overall image. And here again, someone um, praying against the wall, um, very quiet type of shot. Um, interesting lighting and it's, it's picked out all of the um, markings on the wall there, but also has retained information in, in the face. So we've got the lighting on the face, which is quite difficult really, because by looking at the way the lighting is coming from on her hand, you think that from behind, and I think it is coming from behind her, but we seem to maintain a lot of detail and light on the face as well. So very well handled. So highly successful. I suppose it's the seeing, we, we accept it's very good camera craft here, but the seeing is what makes it stand out, surely. Certainly, yes. And we can see that uh, the photographer has been able to give us different viewpoints on, on the cultures of these people, uh, from close-ups on the face to little, <coughs> excuse me, um, little poignant, important moments, like the praying on number 10 and the prayers on no, number one. So they, they captured the, just the right moments. So in fact, what we're doing is we're getting far more information. It's not just a record shot. There's, there's much more of a narrative here. There is, yes, definitely. Especially in the, the, the top row, I'd say. Maybe, Stuart, we can have another look at my favorite in this panel, which is number three. Yeah. Uh, which it really is stupid. I mean, this is above the level required for licentiate, we should say. It's very powerful, yes. Very powerful indeed. And that's a lovely image. Well, yeah. congratulations to Yilan Song, LRPS, and thank you for letting us uh, see your images. Um, so, sadly, however, uh, if a panel is felt not to meet the criteria, it can't be recommended because we do need to uphold the standards at each level of distinction. We're always disappointed when this happens, I can tell you, because we really do want everyone to get through. So time then to meet one of those brave souls who didn't quite make it. Sue Phillips. Hello, Sue. I hope Sue Phillips is with us. Sue Phillips is here. Ah, have you switched your <laughs> Hello, video? Good evening. There you are. How are you? Yeah, fine, thank you. Fine. So um, let's have a look at your panel now then, shall we? Thank so you. tell us a bit about it and how you started thinking about what you would do? Uh, right. Um, first of all, I, yes, I, I uh, um, didn't belong to the uh, society until I took one of these images, which I shall talk about later. Um, and uh, once I had joined, um, I had some ideas for, for a, um, a little licentiate. Um, I took along some images to a an advisory day, uh, which was uh, run by Rosemary Willman. Um, and uh, she chose, um, from the pictures I had submitted, she chose uh, six on that particular day. And they are actually, well, we have that panel there. Um, she, from the ones that I had put forward, she had suggested that I keep number one, number two, and number three, um, number five, number seven and number eight. How did you feel about the other images not making the grade? Uh, uh, the ones that she didn't select, yes. um, I fully understood uh, she um, were two particular ones that uh, were sort of, um, uh, sort of nature and natural history things. Um, I'm not a wildlife photographer and obviously it was quite clear that that I hadn't met the standard at all as far as wildlife photography was concerned. It's not, it wasn't a great interest of mine, but I tried to show variety in that respect, but um, uh, she, she felt that I should stick with the sort of genre that I prefer, which 
tends to be more graphic um, and a little abstract. And would you agree with that? Pardon? Would you agree with that, what she said, that you, you're I, better off sticking to this? I, I, I felt so, uh, I, much more within my comfort zone, this, this, this sort of, uh, these sorts of images, yeah. So then you eventually went to your assessment. When was that? Uh, well, in the meantime, I also had um, um, an advisory session online, which was, was helpful, because uh, uh, I, I had to choose more images to put in. Um, and again, uh, the session that I had online was very helpful. Uh, in, re in fact, they recommended that I uh, um, convert the whole of the top line to, to black and white. Originally, it had only been the trumpeter in the middle, um, and the others were in colour. Um, and I think it actually works quite well with, with, with the line of black and white. And just to be um, clear, this advice was anonymous written advice? It was anonymous written advice, that's correct, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, so when was the assessment? Uh, it was at the beginning of, uh, um, or just before we had lockdown. Um, and uh, during lockdown, obviously, I worked quite hard on, on uh, making the changes that were recommended to me. Um, and would have actually preferred, would have liked some, some more advice, but obviously in the situation it was, it was difficult. And um, you now have this wonderful one-to-one, -one, which I'm looking forward to having, uh, actually, um, uh, that I think had come in after I'd made my submission. I, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure, but I certainly didn't find it online at the time. So, unfortunately, you weren't recommended. And I've no. got here the feedback from the chair of the licentiate panel. Uh, who says this, this is clearly the work of a creative and capable photographer with a good eye for composition and shape, who is not afraid to take the odd risk. So far, so good. Uh, however, a lack of attention to some aspects of the criteria have let the panel down. So that was quite complimentary, but you weren't quite there. And the specifics yeah. of the feedback said this, image three, this is the advice, ensure the end of the trumpet is tack sharp. Image four, perhaps reduce the contrast a little. Images seven and nine, beautifully seen, but may have been overprocessed. Image 10, lacks a clear point of interest. So I have to ask you, what do you think of that feedback? Um, I, um... Yes, I fully understand uh, what's, what's been said. Um, I will definitely be removing number 10. Um, that was the one that I had to choose uh, without any advice at all. I have a similar type of image. Um, I was advised to put in um, some form of landscape or wildlife, and obviously I chose not to do the wildlife side of it. I have another image similar to that, which has got a very strong um, uh, dying tree in, in the foreground, which I think possibly would, would make a better image. And as it is a landscape format, I would put that into the centre uh, uh, num at number eight and maybe move number eight through to number 10, yeah. Well, it's a great um, shame uh, you weren't recommended, but it looks like you really are almost there. Shall we bring Ray in, see what Ray thinks? Indeed, that's a good idea, unless you want me, well, yes, let's do let's that. Let's have Ray, what do you think, yeah. Ray? Um, yes, well, I, I agree with the comments, which certainly um, that you do have uh, your own individual vision of what you're looking at, and some of the images that I think are extremely strong. I mean, I, I do love number eight, I think, that's so well seen. Um, I quite like the use of the square format that you're using, very popular nowadays. You show creativity, certainly in image number one, where you've got the, the zoom shot. Um, that, that particular shot I, I, I very much like. Um, it reminds me of the vorticists in some respect, uh, going back into uh, art history. Uh, I, I really like that shot. So it shows that you, you are thinking, you're using different techniques, you're trying things out, and you're trying to make your own, uh, own statements. I think some of them, particularly this shot, 
is over contrasty and it, it is probably a weaker shot as far as your your whole panel is concerned so you think working at the right sort of level but it's now a question of just putting the panel it together is, yeah and some of the things were fairly minor i mean the criticism of this shot was that the um, end of the trumpet was slightly out of focus now with something like this i think you've either got to make it pin sharp or really out of focus to make the point because sometimes as i say people uh, particularly at licentiate are not totally in control of their camera and it shows when just little things are off and that's what we're looking for if you were to really throw the um the the man's face out of focus and the trumpet sharp that would show that you were doing it i know that you particularly like the eyes here um but sometimes uh, less is more and it can become a little bit complicated with the microphone the eyes the end of the trumpet etc so maybe just concentrating a little bit more on technique it will help and what about the interesting comment about number seven and number nine beautifully seen but may have been over processed yeah i think this is in some respects um a little bit of a matter of personal taste um i th they are very strong images if we get to them that's number seven um which uh, i think is very powerful it's almost like a screen print to me my old days of screen printing just using minimal colors and i know tony um was also uh, was a screen printer so i i'm I, I i quite like that other shot i find this one a little more disconcerting i i don't find this so agreeable uh, but that's my personal opinion and i don't think it has the design uh, of the other shot um um i i think you know with things which are more abstract it's a little bit more about uh, the aesthetics here, I love this shot. I, I, I love the, the reflections. I love the format. We we'll go back to it. Go back to the, the last. That's right. Lovely shot. Uh, I say I love the reflections, the three figures walking across and the figure in the bottom left just turning round, looking out of the picture. And that's that's something which actually has worked extremely well. Um, and here again, I think the square format has worked very well. And as you said, putting it to the end of your panel, it will end and be looking backwards and those figures will be working walking backwards um, into the center i think that will work as a very good end stop to your panel okay. so so anything else you'd like to say um it, it's very interesting uh, the number seven one which uh was um uh it was mentioned i believe that that was that was uh, over processed um and it, it has had quite a number of things done to it in, in an editing suite. Uh, it, the original photograph is actually the curve of the, um, they are actually stepping stones in a swimming pool, uh, going from bottom, bottom right to top right. Um, I copied that image and um, it's been inverted colour-wise. Um, and uh, then I, I layered the two together. Um, so yes, it has been uh, very heavily uh, um, edited, um, but you know that that is it's interesting that uh, some people like it and some people don't. It is that particular image that is the main reason why I'm sitting here today, in as much as uh, <laughs> Tony Warwick had uh, been running a course which was about uh, editing. Um, and the second course I went on, which was about uh, composition and critiquing, I took that one along and he suggested that I join the society and work towards um, getting the distinction. So, you know, I'm here today because of that image, but um, oh, good for you, know, you, it, it, you like it or you don't, I think. <laughs> and I'll emphasize as we say. I, mean, I must, must say, so as far as I'm concerned, it's not about liking or disliking, well, um, okay. because cer certainly that sort of, very much uh, coloration uh, and maybe almost posterization which you've got there yeah. is not to everybody's taste no. but i can see in that shot i can see good use of color good use yeah. of design uh, which is why even if it's not my style of photography i can appreciate yes. what you did whereas yes. the other one didn't have those features i felt no. so but 
remember when when we're on a panel there's usually four or five people yeah. and often we disagree um mm. because we try to be as objective as possible we try obviously to keep to the criteria um but also um we are human and there are certain tastes which we which we have mm -hmm. or we may see something in, in an abstract picture which other people don't see yes, yes so Steve, think, uh, when, when are you planning to put in it for licentiate again i i will um as i say i would like very much to have the, a, a one-to-one -one, uh, looking at these particular pictures uh, particularly with reference to the last one which was i think probably the weakest uh, number 10 um i had a choice of two and I was working on my own and I had to make a decision and obviously it's the wrong decision. So I would like somebody to advise me on the alternative picture and then possibly uh, put forward a few others to, to discuss you know, arrangement and um, uh, maybe one or two others that, that could replace, if necessary, number seven or, or number nine, I, I don't know. Fine, yeah. well, we can arrange that advice and I wish you all the very best for the future. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you, sir. Nice to see you, Stu. Uh, so, Ray, the next panel is a bit more conventional in the sense that all the images were taken in the UK. Just to prove the point, you don't necessarily have to travel very far uh, to take the images you want. And uh, it comes from Philip Bedford, LRPS. So congratulations to Philip. Um, nice mixture here, weddings, portrait, and landscape. Yeah, it's really nice to see some good wedding photography. Uh, there must be thousands of wedding photographers out there, hopefully many of them that belong to the society, but we don't often see uh, good wedding photography. We don't often see wedding photography, which is amazing uh, when you consider how much must be taken. Um, but this is a good mixture of the, um, the posed wedding images um, landscapes, still life, um, and, and architecture. Um, so Let's go through them then, shall we? This is a, a really well-balanced panel. Yeah, landscape is, as we know, is like most photography, is all about light. And this um, composition here is about these repeating forms of the hills, which are picked out by the, uh, the backlight. Um, and the angle of the hills taking this diagonal gives some sort of uh, motion as it were uh, to the landscape limited color well handled no burnt out highlights good detail in the shadows it's all we expect from a, a good landscape photograph first i think of three wedding shots here all slightly different um taken in the landscape here again lovely lighting rim lighting coming around the, the couple. Um, all the details being held well in, the, in both the um, highlights and shadows. None of the, the bride's um, dresses burnt out. The use of differential focus, possibly with a slightly long lens has been very well handled. Um, just enough of the background without it in, impinging and a, a, a lovely pose, I'm sure. The couple will be delighted with that. Much more natural portrait. Very looks very simple, but again, lovely lighting. We, if, if you ever want to know about lighting, always look at the eyes. That will tell you some eyes. Not only reflect the soul, they reflect the lighting as well. So we can see uh, highlights at top and bottom of the eyes here indicating how this was lit to give a lovely soft natural appearance and again a very limited depth of feel and a beautifully natural expression on the girl's face. Here trying to be a little more creative um, possibly confetti or something being thrown in front of the camera just to add a little bit of depth and movement into the picture but again a lovely expression on the face lovely lighting in the background nice autumn-y type feel, which I suppose is reflected by the, the, the uh, confetti falling um, in the foreground. It's 
Now, again, we've seen a different approach to two wedding photographs, different to the portrait. Here, again, we've gone back out into the landscape. Um, in this case, I would suggest the photographers using uh, some sort of flash lighting to highlight the, the figures. And again, that's been very well handled. Um, unusual in some respects in terms of the uh, the, the uh, figures um, going out of the, moving out of the picture, as it were, the, the lines moving up and out, uh, but again on a strong, strong uh, third. Uh, and again, uh, the, the balance between the ambient light and the flash has worked very well. Totally different here, we're going into architecture stroke landscape. Um, again, uh, taking just a lovely time of day or night or evening. <clears throat> We've got this beautiful warm light just caressing the back of the, 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 the castle there and the trees in the foreground and the beautiful reflection. So it's forming a very, very steady, calm image. Move on. I think it's just a beautiful uh, landscape. Very soft, cold, lovely tonality. Got that lovely brisk morning or, or late afternoon. Um, the trees stand out lovely against the, the white of the fields. We've got that <clears throat> road meandering through from the bottom right into the end of the picture there holding it all together. Lovely muted colours and a very understated sky as well together. It's one of my favourite landscape shots. Timing is what it's all about and being there. Again, timing here. Um, obviously, one can visit this at almost any time uh, to get the shot. But this is taken at a fabulous time where everything's lit, beautiful reflections um, and still detail in the sky. So it's taken at a time when the sky hasn't gone completely. Um, so we see the nice silhouettes of the minarets or whatever they are against the sky and the lovely use of colour, very strong colour um, and detail throughout. No burnt out highlights, which is difficult. Um, when you're looking at buildings which have been lit. Back to the wedding type shot, this time taken at night. Um, so, I mean, weddings occur all through the year and very often they, they finish when it's getting dark. So the photographer's done extremely well to set up the lighting here, to light the figures, against the, um, the background and included here to fill the, the dark void. We've got these rain or, or snow drops coming down, lovely reflection. Uh, the umbrellas help to reflect some light back, but it's added to the, the whole atmosphere of the, of the image. Technically very good. And again, totally different, going into the studio this time, doing a, a still life shot of a loaf of bread. Well, what could be simpler? And we got the, the, um, the flour being um, showered down onto the bread and good use of the shutter speed, just to get a little bit of movement uh, as the, as the uh, flour is coming off from the bottom of the bread. Detail held in the high Highlight. It's backlit or side lit, um, so but we've still got detail in those highlights, and even we've got detail in the shadow at the bottom of the bread there. So again, very very well lit, very well exposed. Okay, well let's come off that now. Um, you say what could be simpler than <laughs> photographing a loaf of bread? We all know you won an award for photographing a potato. <laughs> That's Am true. I right? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I'm now potato photographer of the year. 
The fact that that is an award above all others. Uh, you talked about weddings. Um, of course, they've all been hit by COVID. Uh, next year is supposedly going to be a record year for weddings because everyone has to uh, restage their cancelled weddings. Uh, so perhaps we'll get a few more wedding type panels. But as you I say, hope so. Yeah, we haven't had many, and possibly it's because everyone thinks they can take pictures of a wedding. No, no. They don't necessarily need a photographer, but we no. will see. No. Um, right, one more panel to look at. And after that, we'll be taking questions. So please, now is the time to use the chat bubble at the bottom of the screen to type in your questions. Just short, pithy ones, please, uh, rather than comments on the work. Now, the last panel comes from Victoria Ferrier, LRPS. Uh, now, again, it's um, a lot of variety, different lenses, different shutter speeds, nice looking, more traditional panel array. It is, yes. And again, it shows um, a good variety of approach um, and certainly uh, subject matter, location, um, use of different materials, monochrome and colour. It fits all of the criteria we, we really look for in a licentiate panel. Okay, shall we look at each image now then? Yeah, seemingly very simple shot. You know, the, your, your member of the family, the canine member of the family. Um, not easy to get good uh, animal shots, I don't think. And this has been done very well, both from the selection, the cropping, the background, which is nicely out of focus, the alert look of the dog's face, the fact he's been out in the, the river is dishevelled. Um, you just, I just love that uh, feeling. This is what a dog is all about to many people, is you know, just enjoying the out. Uh, and that shows in this image. I love this shot. Very, again, seemingly very simple, uh, plain background, isolating uh, the two faces, monochrome, expression on the little baby's face. I mean, you can't make it up. Um, it's, it's wonderful. And the, the lady looking at the, the baby thinking, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it's not going to hurt that much. Don't worry. And, you know, just see the, the, the love between uh, her and the, and the little baby and the size of the hands against the, uh, the arm. It all works very well together. Very good natural history shot. I'd say. Well, I hope it's a good natural history shot. Uh, I, I, I have hasten to say I'm a, not a natural history expert, but to me, this um, really shows the bird, the heron, um, pin sharp, all, de all the detail on the heron in its natural environment, um, isolated against a, a lovely background, nothing intruding which is going to uh, get in the way or... Um, be distracting, lovely lighting, nice soft lighting, uh, picking out all of the detail. Um, bird in a perfect position, just walking through the waves there, uh, looking for its prey. Very nice shot. Totally different. Um, again, uh, more of an abstract uh, uh, shot using monochrome, looking upwards, strong shapes going left to right, top left to bottom right. Um, so it shows a different approach to the photographer to the other images. Again, uh, slightly different looking upwards again, but this time in color, very use of color, the, the, the yellows and the blues. Uh, it's very well seen this, um, and it's very well handled as well. Uh, the circular, um, radiating circles and little ladders makes very interesting composition. We talked, I think, in another uh, panel about frame within a frame uh, and, and the use of frames is a, a good technique to use sometimes to isolate features uh, of, of architecture where the surroundings may be a little bit more uh, complicated. I'm not saying this is, uh, but again, it's worked very well in the shape of the frame uh, reflects the shape of the dome. The colours are very limited, so that that blue, a little bit of gold, and the the the, the off yellow on the side. So uh, very well handled, 
and you'll see it's lovely symmetrical shape. Um, a lot of the thought has been um, got into where the photographer stands and isolating that particular uh, building. Totally different type of building here. We've gone to, gone to monochrome. Um, here we we haven't got the reflection as much because we've got a lot of wind on the uh, causing ripples on the on the water, but we have got this rather nice foreground of the water lilies, uh, which acts as a lovely base to this, and it works well in monochrome, and just using the the trees again as a as a frame at the top. Yes, beautiful uh, lighting here, taken just at the right time of the evening, one assumes. Um, in this case, we have got the, the lovely reflections. Uh, the, the trees enclose those um, much more modern high-rise buildings in the background. Limited colour to blues and yellows, particularly in the sky. Everything fits well together, well seen and very well photographed. Um, this is a much more uh, type of landscape we might see in, the, in this country, um, much more peaceful, I suppose, uh, more reserved, certainly in terms of colour, though the little boat in red forms a very strong uh, point to, for the eye to land on. But having said that, we've got this lovely curve going around of the jetty, which comes from the bottom right into the centre. Um, it has a sense of peace. And it communicates that sense to me. And of course, it wouldn't be right if we didn't end on a sunset. <laughs> I just love clouds. I love looking at clouds. And the end of the day is a great time to observe and photograph. Constantly changing. They're ethereal. They're only there for a very short period of time. Um, and they're wonderful to see. So this is a lovely image to end on. Well, congratulations to Victoria Ferrier, uh, LRPS, on her panel. So let's come off that now, Stuart, if we can, and talk about now, Ray, you can apply licentiate, associate, fellowship. You can go in at any level you like. Yeah. That could be a bit challenging. How should people decide which level to go in at? Well, as we've seen, I think, from today, um, the standard of licentiate is very good. Um, if you are a keen amateur, you're just starting your photography, maybe you join a camera club or you've started taking photographs of your family, friends, even uh, social events, that sort of thing, I would suggest licensorship is where you should start. Most of us started there, I certainly did, and I learned a lot by going through that journey as it were. Um, Associateship and fellowship are a totally different matter. Um, and I think really you need experience if you're going to tackle either of those. Um, we're lucky in that we have some wonderful photographers in this society. Um, but maybe a number of really good professional photographers or seasoned photographers have not... Um, put in for a distinction because they feel that they're beyond the licentiate level. And for those sort of people, it's natural to go straight to either associateship or fellowship. Um, and if you are an experienced photographer, maybe a professional photographer, or the maybe done work for books, exhibitions, etc., you feel that you now know exactly what your direction is and what your style is. We're looking for personal style. And certainly with fellowship, we're looking at distinctive style, um, which is very hard to achieve unless you spend a lot of time working at your photography. We should, of course, say you can apply for not only digital submissions and print submissions, but also in the sense of a book submission as well. Yeah. And talking of assessments, the new autumn season begins tomorrow with the natural history panel. And for the first time since the virus lockdown, we are able to accept print submissions. However, there are still restrictions in RPS House. So we had to come to a compromise. A print expert will be at headquarters with the prints 
on the wall in the normal way and they will look purely at the technical side of the submission. The panel assessors, the members, will assess digitally on the content only. They will then ask the print expert, who won't have a vote by the way, for their opinion on the technical side of the images before coming to a decision. Not ideal, but is, is the best we can do in the circumstances and we'll continue like this for as long as restrictions are in place. So, as I said, that was the last panel. Thank you to everyone uh, who's let us see their work and particular thanks to Mike and Sue for talking about their work. So we're now going into the question and answer session and I want to introduce a couple more people. Uh, Andy Moore. Are you there, Andy? Our distinctions manager, switch on your video. I think he's coming in a moment. And Simon Verko, who is the distinctions assistant. Uh, there he is. And Stuart Even. Wall, who we've heard <laughs> referred to already. Um, so we've got a cast of thousands and we can uh, hopefully answer any questions you have. So the first one is, are in-camera techniques accepted, such as multiple exposure? Ray, would you like to answer that one? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. No problem at all. I mean, you do have to remember, uh, we're, we're talking about licentiate today, so pretty much anything goes. Um, when we're looking at associateship and uh, fellowship, we go into various genres. And so some of those techniques would not be um, applicable, uh, particularly in maybe uh, more of a documentary or a nature panel. But yes, absolutely. You, you fill your boots, do as many different techniques as you can. Okay, Stuart, two questions I'm gonna to link together. Can we use Photoshop? And in terms of post-processing, what is acceptable? You can absolutely use Photoshop. It's, uh, it's one of our tools of the trade now. Um, as in, when you're using it, if when the assessors look at the image, they can see the processing and it's not appropriate to the image, that's where there might be a slight issue. So it's where the processing becomes too um, obvious if that makes sense but photoshop is a very very important tool of the uh, trade now so that the key phrase you used there was appropriate for the image absolutely yeah so um what is appropriate well we saw those very gentle relaxing scenes didn't we of the uh, the harbor if they'd have been over processed then there might have been a question mark over whether the processing was appropriate to the communication of that image okay Simon Verko mm -hmm. two for you and it's all about one-to-one -one portfolio review I mentioned earlier it's a zoom thing where you share the screen with an assessor what are the costs of a one-to-one -one and how okay. many of them can I have okay great questions Peter uh, the cost is uh, 25 pound for a non-member and 20 pounds for members um, they're 40 minutes long or so each um, and you can go for two. Um, we certainly recommend you go in, have get a pile of work together, you have 10 images set up um, as your proposed panel with say about five spare images. Um, perhaps you're not quite sure which ones to use uh, and arrange to have a one-to-one. -one. Once you've had some feedback, you may need to use that time to make some adjustments. So that's why we allow you to then go in for a second one-to-one uh, uh, -to, -one to see if you're heading in a, a better direction, perhaps. And perhaps this next one for you, Simon, as well. If, if you want to put in for a digital sequence um, rather than prints, what advice would you give on the sequencing of the images? Okay, again, very good question. For sequencing, the panel members are looking at exactly the same criteria as it is for uh, the print submissions, but we're looking at an alternative way of uh, presenting the work. So when you're looking at a sequence, we're wanting to see how the one image leads on to the next. Um, and it's not just in the content. We're looking for perhaps orientation, how landscaped portrait images uh, affect the, the view and the flow of these, these 10 images, and also the brightness, and uh, the contrast of the images um, maybe put yourself in a darkened room, switch off all the lights, 
set your images to a slideshow of about seven seconds, let your eyes adjust to the darkness, and you'll quickly see for yourself whether or not a sequence is working. Um, but in all cases, I would strongly recommend that every applicant who's starting off on this before you go for a one-to-one -one and start putting your work together, do go online and download our free guides um, to have a good read through those. Uh, we've got one for everything, a guide on how to apply, and we have one specifically for the licentiate. Lovely, good advice. Thank you very Peter, much. Peter, can I just jump in there? We've had we've had a lot of questions, and it's very interesting that most of those questions that that could be answered by reading the guidelines. Most of the answers are in the guidelines, so it's really important to to look at the guidelines and the criteria. That will answer, I would say, a good high high eighty percent of the questions that we've been asked through the chat chat room. However, given you're with us, Andy, let's make you work. So. Yeah, sorry about the bat light. I've got very, <laughs> like, a halo going on there. Is there any place right. in there I can get a decent... Here's one, here's one for you, then. What print size would you recommend? Um, it does vary on the type of images that you're going to actually submit because we, we get various sizes. I mean, we've had very sort of subtle, like, in fine art images. Maybe a so smaller image would be more suitable, but... When people ring me up for licentiate, what I sort of say is a good A4 print is better than a poorly printed A3. So I would go an A4, A4 size with a good 20 by 16 mount white or ivory. That's how the standard majority of people, that's what they use. But again, you can vary the print size within the mount, whichever suits the image. But we would say don't over enlarge. There is no, there's no need to over enlarge the image make sure the quality is there. So good A4 print, good 20 by 16 mount, ivory when, uh, ivory or white, and you're, you, you're pretty much uh, set, I would say. But of course, this is not a requirement. It's just something people can do. And yeah. we have had images much, much smaller, haven't we? The sort of fine art type images where you have to look in more closely can sometimes be very effective. It depends on the subject matter. Absolutely. We had a fellowship with, I think, if I remember correctly, it was three inches by three inches tulips. It was it was an outstanding portfolio submission. So absolutely. The maximum size you can go is 23 inches. That's the mount size. That's the maximum because that's by the rails that we've got at um, HQ and in three rows as well. So that's the only the only limit that we actually say. But like I said, a good A4 print is you're pretty much on safe ground there. That's what we would recommend. Okay, thank you. Let's go over to Stuart now. Um, do you need, the next question says, do you need a statement of intent at licentiate level? No, you don't. The, uh, the criteria is published. This is the sort of guidance, if you like, as to some of the um, camera craft that really you should be um, embedding within your images. But as Ray said earlier on, as you develop your photographic ability, that criteria will almost become um, evident by default. But that's where the statement of intent, if you like, comes in with licentiate. You do not write your own. Fine. Um, now, again, Stuart, should a print submission all be on the same paper? OK, well, normally they are. However, we have had some very successful panels where there has been some subtle changes in the paper. But when you first look at the panel as a whole, we haven't noticed. It's only when we've walked up and noticed that there is different paper being used, which is appropriate for the subject matter. So for example, a subtle fine art image might require a different paper or might benefit from a different paper than a high glossy um, picture. But the important thing is that when we look at the whole panel, it's not totally obvious. And it's not in your eye. Does that make sense? OK, thank you. Now, let's go back to Ray Spence. Um, one person has asked a question. They're a little bit confused. Sometimes they've seen monochrome images, sometimes not. And so the question is, do you have to have a black and white image in your panel? No. <laughs> it's the simple answer. You don't. Um, it's totally up to you. Um, if monochrome works uh, for the particular photograph you're taking, for the particular image, or enhances it, use monochrome. Uh, but no, there's no compulsion to either have all monochrome, all colour, 
or a mixture. You can go whichever you like. Um, it's a good idea, um, hazard, but um, no, you don't have to use monogram. Can you use black mounts? Is the next question. Well, you can do. Um, and uh, funnily enough, I mean, mounting of images tends to go in fashions. At one time, we always used to use black mounts. Uh, there was a time when we always used to have flush mounts with nothing around the outside at all. Um, generally speaking, um, it's more the uh, protocol now to use either a white or a, an off-white mount. It seems to work for most images. But I've seen some very effective uh, panels using black mounts, uh, particularly with high colour. Um, it's they, they if you've got high colour, glossy metallic type images, if that's the style that you have, they sometimes look quite good against shiny black mounts. So it depends on the type of photography you're doing. Discriminate against them, but the one thing you shouldn't do is to make the mounts detract from the images. Um, we see this sometimes with people who try to make the mounts a little bit too complicated, drawing lines around them and various other things like that. So your eye is drawn to the mount rather than the image? Precisely. Okay, another one for you, Ray. Can I mix images taken on 35 millimeter medium format and digital? Yes, of course you can. Um, and again, we, d we're not, we don't care what camera you use, or even if you use a camera, to be honest. Um, as long as it's appropriate for the images. Um, now, generally speaking, if you're putting a cohesive panel together on a particular subject, you might want to use the same technique throughout. But at Licentiate, one can do a, an image on a 35 mil or even digital, which is very grainy, and that suits the image. Or you might do a very fine uh, architectural shot on, on large format film. Um, it depends upon the particular image you're taking, what the best choice is. Okay, and the last one now is to Andy Moore. Um, if you've already had written online advice, would you still recommend going for a one-to-one? -one? Which brings to mind, of course, Sue Phillips, because she's had online written advice, but she is going for one-to-one. -one. But what's your general advice, Andy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we introduced online advice, I think it was a couple of years ago, to help applicants on their photographic journey for applying for a distinction. Uh, and one of the things that's come of COVID, we've always wanted to introduce this one-to-one -one portfolio reviews. And being in lockdown, funny enough, has brought it forward by about a year. So we're really pleased with it. So absolutely. The difference is, with the online advice, it wasn't a two-way conversation, as Sue, Sue mentioned. You, you can read a line of text and, and read it at various ways. The beauty about the one-to-one -one portfolio reviews is a two-way discussion, as she mentioned, and with Mike mentioned with Stuart, you're, you're having a discussion with a, uh, with a panel member about your images and how they fulfill or not fulfill the criteria. Uh, we've been running these since April and the feedback has been superb. Um, and the people are finding it really beneficial having that they can answer and ask any questions that they like. And if a panel member points out a particular area that they're not sure of, they can obviously get that clarified. And I think that is really working extremely well, not only from the applicant's point of view, but more importantly, from a society point of view, I think we're now starting to give extremely good advice. Unfortunately, Ray didn't have it back in his day, but uh, certainly I think over the last couple of years, we are starting to really help applicants um hopefully achieve their distinction and you know um improve their photography okay that's great and i'm afraid that's all we had time for and my grateful thanks to ray spence in particular but also to our technical guru stuart wall as well as andy moore and simon verko and of course mike kitchingman and sue phillips for coming along to talk and to everyone who's joined us we hope it's helped you and next tuesday we'll be covering the associate distinction level. Same format, great panels, but also the chairs of the various genres and applicants talking about their work. So do join us then. And don't forget there are always hints and tips on our Facebook page, which is called the RPS Distinctions Official Group. And it's open to everyone to join, whether you're a member of the RPS or not. But for now, it's goodbye from everyone here at the Royal Photographic Society. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Yes, bye. <laughs>